Hello, and welcome to 5-Minute Math. Today we are looking at the lessons learned from the 2023 5th grade STAR test. My name is Aaron Daffron, the creator of the 5-Minute Math videos, and we're going to be looking at the readiness standards across the state of Texas in which uh, students scored less than 50% mastery. So you notice there's just a few readiness standards that students uh, did less than 50% on. Students struggled more with the supporting standards on uh, this test than the readiness standards, but we'll look at the readiness standards because remember those count for two-thirds of the questions on the test. So let's look at these three. We're going to start with 5.5a, classifying 2D shapes. And this first one was a little bit tricky, right? 30% correct, and it's multiple choice. So we can't blame this on any type of new item type or anything. It's a Venn diagram, but most of the time we see Venn diagrams, we see them like this, and they're supposed to kind of find the overlapping area. Uh, but this could have, you know, bothered students a little bit because they've got a circle within a circle within a circle, knowing that this inner circle has to satisfy both acute triangles and triangles, right? And so once we do that, now we've got a lot of vocab, right? We've got scalene, right, isosceles. My answer here is D equilateral. Equilateral triangles are always going to be acute, but there's no, there's a visual there, but there's nothing else to kind of help me. And I need to know as a student what a scalene, or right, an isosceles in an equilateral triangle is. And then on number 20, they did a little bit better. This is what we would consider more of a traditional Venn diagram here. But you notice that set A has got words, polygons with at least one right angle. Set B doesn't have any words. So we have to infer what our uh, normal uh, rule is going to be here. So this is going to be a parallelogram. But they have to understand, okay, so if that's a parallelogram, then that means that whatever's in the middle here needs to be a parallelogram with at least one right angle. And the answer here is going to be A, right? That is going to be our rectangle. Uh, and the issue here is that's a triangle, and then these two are pentagons. So they don't fit uh, that parallelogram four-sided shape metric. So let's see what we can learn about these two problems. So what made them difficult? Well, the students needed a lot of vocabulary. And so we gave, you know, for example, scalene, isosceles, equilateral. None of that is on our reference materials. So students had to know that going into it and not only just knowing what those are. It really would have been helpful if they could have drawn some of these. All right, so a scaling triangle is a triangle that's got, you know, three sides of different lengths. Isosceles has got a side with two equal lengths. And equilateral has got all three sides equal. And they had to know that you see I've got a, you know, a scaling here that's, obtuse, but I've got a, you know, a scalene here that's uh, acute, right? I have an isosceles that's acute, but they could also draw an isosceles that's right. We could also draw an isosceles that is obtuse. So students needed to know a lot about these different triangles and which of these uh, scalene here, right? Like scalene, isosceles, equilateral, these are all side lengths. And how can we describe a triangle both by side length, but also by its angle, acute, right, or obtuse. So that's a lot that students had to come in there, and there really wasn't anything within that problem to give them any type of context clues uh, to help if they were a little bit short on that vocabulary. And, you know, we had to go between side length and angle, and sometimes students don't know that you can classify any triangle both ways. So they uh, had to sometimes classify by side length, you know, by angle, and both of those are valid ways of classifying triangles. And then this Venn diagram, like I said, was non-traditional. The circle, within the circle, within the circle, uh, that was a little bit uh, probably less comfortable and familiar than the traditional Venn diagram. And then what made the other one difficult, number 20, was the fact that it was given in both pictorial and word form, right? And the pictorial form, I think that was the problem, understanding that it was a parallelogram, that had to, you had to do a little bit of work to figure that out. So down here in white, what we have here are our instructional considerations. So what does this mean for us as educators? Well, we just need to get into the practice of making sure our students are comfortable classifying any triangle they see by both side length and angle. 
every single time, even if it's just asking for side length. Make them name acute, obtuse, or right as well. Even if it's just asking for acute, obtuse, or right, have them do the side length, isosceles, scalene, equilateral. Get both of them all the time so they're comfortable recognizing that a triangle can be both. And then we get used to that Venn diagram, right? But uh, how do we practice converting from the Venn diagram to other graphic organizers? Could we uh, use, um, you know, maybe a table or a flow chart or, uh, you know, something like that that's not always just a Venn diagram? Because once they get um, used to practicing like this Venn diagram up here, right? And how could they have, uh, you know, done that differently, even with words, right? Uh, you could do other... Um, graphic organizers, right? But you, you could have said all acute triangles are triangles. And that's what that's saying, right? Because this it was the second circle was inside that first circle. That means that all acute triangles are triangles. And so uh, we need to get them to practice. And, you know, there's Venn diagrams. Sometimes we'll see like a uh, it wouldn't necessarily work in this problem, but we'll see something like this, right? We'll see like a little, almost looks like a mobile, right? And they need to see that each of these three are a part of this larger one. So there's different types of graphic organizers that they need to be familiar with. And then it was the, that last one, is that pictorial classification, right? The parallelograms. Uh, that's the one where it would have been good if students had practice whenever they see a pictorial classification like that write it in words right just like we saw in the first one it was just in words right so how do we write this uh parallelograms right just put a label on there because if they could put a label on it that means that they understand what the classification is so our next one was 5.4 h we had 39 percent overall mastery we are looking at perimeter and area as it's related to volume. So this one was a little bit tricky here. We had the perimeter of a rectangular rug, right? And we had the, the whole perimeter is 2.4 meters. The length is 0 0.8. We don't know what the width is. What's the width, right? Well, we could have doubled it, right? So those two together would have been 1.6. So if I take the 1.6 away, Right, that's going to be 0 0.8 left, but it's not 0 0.8 because that 0 0.8 needs to go for both widths. So I need to cut that in half. Right, obviously this is not proportional. This is 0 0.4, right? And obviously, uh, you know, a good strategy would have been to add everything up afterwards. Whatever their answer is, knowing that perimeter is, you know, the four sides together that's 8 16 20 24 2.4 so our answer there is a uh, we did a little bit better on number 32 uh, we had you know a rectangular prism that we kind of had to visualize here now we did have a volume equals base times height right that was um, a formula that students could have used on the reference chart and so our volume was 96, right? So I'm just going to substitute in 96. I don't know what my base is, but I know my height is 6. So something times 6 makes 96. Hopefully students knew that we could, you know, we could use division there to find the missing factor. And that's going to give me 16. And then, then I've got to count. And the only one that equals 16 is going to be A, right? So what does that mean for us as educators? Well, it was difficult because uh, we had to use, first off, you know, this formula, P equals 2O plus 2W. That was the first one. Um, and they had to use that, but think about this. The concepts of substitution and isolating the variable are known strategies. Anyone that's worked with, you know, middle school, when you're thinking like this, right, P equals 2L plus 2W, right? So they gave you uh, the perimeter was the 2.4. And the length was the 0 
plus 2w, right? If you give that to any middle schooler or high schooler, they're going to isolate the variable, right? They're going to uh, subtract 1.6 from both sides of the equation, right, to kind of cancel that out. And then you're going to get, you know, 0 0.8 equals 2w, and they're going to know that, oh, okay, you divide both sides by 2, right, using the properties uh, of equality there to make sure you do the same thing on both sides and you get that. But those aren't concepts that are known in fifth grade. So we have to do a little bit more work with visuals and fact families. So that made that difficult. And then the most chosen answer was D on number 10. So let's look at that real quick. Right on number 10, it was this one. So they might have done all of this work right here, right? Um, uh, and, you know, realize it was 0 0.8 and not split that in half. Maybe they doubled it. Maybe they just subtracted, right? 2.4 minus 0 0.8. It's 1.6. So there was a lack of conceptual understanding there, making me think, even though there was a visual there, students didn't really know that how to find the perimeter um, when there's, you know, given the perimeter and a missing side length. I think if you gave them all four sides, you know, most of them can add up all four sides, but that made it a little bit more difficult. That lack of conceptual understanding really showed because they didn't know how to find a missing side length if given the perimeter. And then they know how, had to use inverse operations to find the missing factor, right? So they don't necessarily know about substitution, isolating the variable. So, um, you know, in both situations, right, they had to use the inverse operation, right? So they had to go 96 equals base times 6. They had to know, all right, so I can use division, right? 96 divided by 6 equals B, right? That's a fact family that they should know about, but that's not one that they probably practice every single day. So what are the instructional implications here for us as educators? So we need to have students practice drawing representations for area perimeter volume problems. We had one on the first one, but the second one really helped out when we drew that representation of our uh, rectangular prism because it really kind of helped us visualize, all right, so we've got that base at the bottom. That's what we're looking for. Uh, because if not, it the volume problem kind of probably looked a little bit strange because none of the visuals match that 96 that they said we had. We need to have students check their answers for reasonableness with a representation. So, like I said on that first one, after you do all your work, can you go back and can you double check your work? Can you draw a picture here and make sure that it makes sense? Because even if you think it's 1.6, which was the most chosen answer, all right, draw me a picture. Draw me a picture where the perimeter is 2.4, the length is 0 0.8. And that's 1.6. And see how that makes sense. Because hopefully they would say, oh, well, that's 2.4. But then you know what? That's 2.4 as well. If they were to draw a picture, that would have helped check their work with reasonableness to see that, oh, I'm missing something here. And then inverse operations. They need to know when they're looking for missing factors, they can use division. They need to know that inverse operations let you find a missing factor, or if you're missing like a, you know, a dividend or a divisor, you can use multiplication. But that's going to help our students before they get into the, uh, the use of substitution and isolating the variables that they'll do in middle school. And then the final reporting uh, category two, or the final standard 5.4c that we have that's less than 50 percent is actually exactly 50 percent was uh, generating number patterns or numerical patterns were given a rule and you see it's either in the form uh, multiplicative or additive right there and so we had 50 percent full credit 17 percent par partial credit right this is a two point problem so 50 percent got two points 17 percent just got that one point and this one was, you know, y equals 0.25x, right? So they they do have that. So we could use a little bit of substitution here. But uh, they give you the y equals 2.5x, but notice that the x is over on the left, right? So now we need to just kind of flip that. 0.25x equals y. 
right? So we need to say, okay, so two would work here, right? So 0 0.25 times two equals, yep, 0 0.5. And then we just need to do that same thing, right? 0 0.25 times seven. Then we had to use the drag and drop, right? So that's gonna be this 175. And if we wanted to say, all right, 0 0.25 times eight, yep, that equals two. So I need to do 0 0.25 times, ooh, 17, right? And that's gonna be that 425. So that's how we got full credit. Hopefully students saw that if we're doing this 0 0.25, right, think of quarters. And when we think 0.25, we should think 25 cents, right? Two cents or two quarters made 50 cents. Seven quarters made a dollar seventy-five. Eight quarters makes two dollars, and then so seventeen quarters. You know, multiplying by zero point two five is hard. Adding a whole bunch of quarters for students usually they can do that. They're pretty good at multi or skip counting by twenty-fives. So let's see what some of our instructional implications are for our students here. First, why is it difficult? Well, we had drag and drop, so that always reduces the certainty of multiple choice. It's a lot easier to work something out and then check to see if your answer is there then to have to drag and drop because you kind of lose that certainty there and then um we had to apply this multiplicative formula for y equals 0 0.25 x and then we had to flip it right we had to flip it like this that's something that's going to be used a lot in middle school uh, and it's something they should be able to do in fifth grade but not every fifth grade teacher might teach it like that so we need to get them used to this idea of when you see something like this, right, you can substitute in a value for x to find the y. Um, a lot of times when we're looking at a table, what we'll do is we'll just kind of cheat a little bit and say, all right, guys, what's, what's the pattern? All right, the pattern is times 0 0.25. The pattern is times 0 0.25. And that is correct. That is the pattern but we won't show them in an equation. So we need to get used to showing them, all right, this is how it works on an equation. And then sometimes you might need to flip it if the X is on the left and the Y is on the right. And then obviously multiplying by decimal. If they weren't skip counting by 25s using the quarters, multiplying by decimal is always kind of tricky, right? That's something that they learn for the first time in fifth grade here. So down at the bottom, instructional implications for us as educators. So we need to have them look for a pattern on the table when given a multiplicative pattern, right? So each lap is a 0.25 or a quarter. Is there an easier way to make this problem? Just so we don't have to do, you know, 0 0.25 times 17. Yes, that's going to get us the answer. But if it's counting by tens, we can think dimes. If it's counting by 0.25s, we can think by quarters. Sometimes there's going to be an easy pattern that's just kind of there for us. And then we could have done some estimation here, right? We could have used quantities to estimate. So let's look back at the problem itself. All right, so look, if I were to take this 8 right here, right, and double it, well, that would be 16. So if I were to double this 2, that's going to be 4. So I know my answer is going to be a little bit more than 4, since 17 is just a little bit more than 16. So yeah, that makes sense that it's 4.25. And then, you know, same with this 2, right? Or this, look at this, this 8. It's just one more than 7, so I need something a little bit less than 2, and that's where that 1.75. So we can use a little bit of reasonableness and estimation to make sure that our answers are correct.